point you learned about what's called a sine diagram? How many have heard that phrase before? So some of you have. If you haven't, I want you to know you, you've been doing them. Okay? When I say a sine diagram, what I mean is this. I'm taking the number line, dividing it up into pieces, and I'm trying to figure out, are we positive or negative in those different sub-intervals, let's say. That's why you notice I've been just interested, hey, are we positive or negative? I don't even care what the values are, per se. Okay? Um, so I just want to make, make a point of that, that when you do the first derivative test, or next week we're going to learn something, the second derivative test, you don't care so much what the values are. All you care is are the values positive or negative. Because if the value is positive, if we know if f prime of x is positive, what does that tell me about the function f of x? If f prime of x is positive, then f of x is what? Increasing. Right? And if f prime of x is negative, then it's decreasing. f of x is decreasing. And so we make these diagrams and we say, look, I'm going to try and find a place where it used to be increasing and now it's decreasing. And whenever I get a picture like that, what's going to happen at that critical value? You're going to get a relative, good, that would be a maximum, okay? And sometimes you may get a relative minimum as well. And so I'm going to pause and go over the group work with you. To, the answers, they put them on the backboard for us. So let's maybe do a little about face. Today, we cover section two of chapter five. Chapter five, section two. And it's entitled, Relative Extrema. Well, it doesn't say that, but it says optimizing functions. Let me, let me write their language, because that's, that's actually smart for you guys to see. Optimizing functions on a closed interval. Now, I talked about open intervals and closed intervals last time we were here. Do you remember what the difference was? When we say a closed interval, what does that mean? Brackets. And what do the brackets mean? We include the endpoints of the interval. Okay? And this is important because it, if you have a closed interval and if you have a continuous function, there's a very important theorem in mathematics, okay? And I'm not going to be proving theorems in this class, okay? But we're definitely going to make use of what the mathematicians have done for us. So here it is. Uh, we do talk about this a lot in another calc class that I teach. The extreme value theorem. The extreme value theorem is what we're going to be using today. And here's what it says. If a function, f of x, is continuous, boy, there's our favorite kind of function, right? On a closed interval a, b, then f of x must assume its maximum value. Well, let's say, how about we say a maximum value and a minimum value on AB. We're going to make good use of this theorem today. 
Actually, it's easy because a lot of our a lot of our functions, maybe almost all of the functions we've been dealing with, are continuous. And they have to be continuous if you want to take the derivative. Okay? I know, that's all some exam one stuff. You just got back exam two, you're like, continuous? I'm not even thinking about that anymore. Well, we're using it all the time, every time we take the derivative. So, what I'd like to do is, is work some examples directly from your book. I hope you either have a book with you or are next to someone that has one. Because I picked out a few problems that I think demonstrate this nicely. And the first, the first I want to do is exercise 28 on page 320. Oh, and before, before I write that down, let me give you a little process that we can refer to, okay? So the process that we're going to use. See, the extreme value theorem, yeah, it's great, tells me I can find a maximum value, tells me I can find a minimum value. But you know what it doesn't tell you? It doesn't tell you how. It just tells you that they're there. So I'm going to give you the process of what you're going to do. Okay? So, step one. We want to find critical values. Now, how many people are very comfortable with what I just wrote down? Find critical values. That You know what I mean. If you're not comfortable, look on the backboard or look on that group. That's what we did, right? We found critical values. Okay. Step two. The maximum and minimum values of f of x on the closed interval a, b will occur either at a critical point or at an end point. So by the end point, I mean x equals a or x equals b. One of these. Either x equals a or x equals b. And so basically what you're going to do is you're going to test these different values. Now I like 28 as a first example. I, th I think we'll try that. So let's do it. Oh. And I should have said this. I wrote it down. You guys didn't question it. But when I say optimizing functions, do you guys know what I'm, I mean by that? Not really. Okay. So optimizing, by the way, this is actually a, a big word in business. Optimizing really means maximizing or minimizing. You want to maximize your costs. No, you want to maximize your... Profit. You want to minimize your costs, right? But like I said yes, yes, on Monday, I said sometimes the boss might say, well, what's the maximum it could cost me? So you may want to do that. And there's a whole field I'm just going to advertise for that you can go into. It's called Operations Research. Raise your hand if you've heard of that field. Matt. That's it? I don't know what it is my dad made Oh, you did, really? Yeah. yeah, so did my wife. Actually, I get I had the same. Re when we, I remember the day we met. We were at a we were at a a, a medical school party, which is kind of funny. I mean, what the heck was I doing there? Right? <laughs> so, so I, I I'm saying so you know oh you're a student where at okay so yeah what are you studying? She said operations research. I'm like you got I'm like what's that? <laughs> and and my, mind you, I had majored in math in college. Okay. What operations research basically is, is using math in the business world to do things like optimize. Okay, optimization. She took a whole course in optimization. All right? So if you happen to like this kind of stuff, she was getting her master's in it, her friends were getting her PhDs in it, and there's jobs out there. Okay? Companies pay big bucks for this stuff. Now, funny, she doesn't, she doesn't even do this anymore. She does computer programming. Okay? But... But it's, it's, it's a nice, nice field to think about if you're strong in math and, 
am interested in this stuff. But I just want to advertise it. All right, enough of that. Let's do our problem. Okay, what did I say? 28? 28. So let's see. Wax and Wick Company. This is a great problem. Okay. So they give me, what's this little P of X stand for? Okay, that's the price. The price where X is the number of boxes of candles, right? And then P of X is the price. And again, in dollars. Okay, so if you charge $102 for a box of candles, nobody's going to buy them, right? So P of zero is 102. Better be under 100 bucks before people start buying candles. What do you think? My, my, uh, my enemies. I had a friend that worked at a candle shop, which is kind of funny. All right, so let's see. So now we want to determine the revenue. Oh, well, you guys ought to be able to do part A, right? How do you get a revenue function if you have a price function? I just went over this from the test. It's x times p of x, because it's, it's the number of boxes you sell times the price. OK, so it's x times 102 minus 3x. And let's do what Matt suggested. Let's, let's avoid the product rule later by simplifying. So this is 102x minus 3x squared. OK, part B. What do we want to do? We want to maximize the revenue, right? That's what it says. It says, hey, how many boxes must be produced and sold to maximize the revenue? Well, if you're trying to maximize the revenue, what's the process? I just wrote down the process. Step one, what do we do? Find the critical value. OK. I want to find critical values of R. So there's a step-by-step -step process for that too, right? All right, what's the first thing I'm going to do then? Take the derivative, right? So we will do this. We'll say R prime of X would be, well, this is an easy one. That's one of the reasons I picked it to start is that the function is simple, right, for the derivative. 102 minus 6X. And so if you want to find critical values, you, you take that and then set it equal to 0. So I get 6x is equal to 102. And so I get x is equal to 18? 17. 17 times 6 is 102. Well, I, I moved the 6x to the right and then swapped sides. So you're right. You might have negative 6x is negative 102, but you're still going to get x equals 17. That's a good point, Gina. You guys with me? Yes. So x is 17. So actually, I think we can answer part B. Part B really asks how many boxes must be sold if we want to maximize the revenue, right? That's what it asks. How do we know the endpoint for this? Ooh, that's a good question. It, are there endpoints? Is there a minimum number of boxes you could sell? Zero. Well, yeah. Zero. Right? You, you, you can't sell any less than that. Is there a maximum number of boxes you can sell? Not really, right? Well, I guess there could be. Let's be reasonable here. I mean, how many how many boxes of candles do we have in this? I mean, if I put 1 million, 10,000, well, if I put enough zeros, you're going to believe me, right? So to be reasonable, there is some upper limit. I just don't know what it is, right? And that's OK. We'll see why in a minute. So then part C. Well, part B, did we answer it? How many boxes must be sold? 17, OK. But you kind of don't have control over that. It's not like you're going to tell the 18th customer, go away. 
You're not going to do that, right? So what happens, what you do have control over is the price. And so part C says, what is the maximum revenue? How do you figure that out? Well, we know we're trying to sell 17 boxes, right? So what we're going to do now is we will compute R of 17. You with me on that? So let's see. Let me work that out. There's my function R. So this is 102 times 17 minus 3 times 17 squared, right? And at this point, I want my calculator, as do you. So according to the masses, this equals 867 what? Okay. So that's, you're not going to get more revenue than that. Again, because what happens if you make more than 17 candles, the only way you, the only way you can sell more is to lower the price so much that we actually start losing revenue. Okay. So that's interesting, I think. All right. Moving on, um, the next, if you turn to the next page, 322, there, there were a couple more I wanted to try. Um, one of them was problem 34. I thought that would be interesting. So let's see if you could read through that and try to start it. I'll give you guys a second to try that. So let's see, for something like 34, it says for part A, I want to maximize what? Profit. Okay. Well, the profit function is not given, is it? But I know that it's the revenue function minus the cost function. Are those given? No. The cost is, but the revenue isn't. Okay. So... The revenue is not given. How do you get the revenue function? Okay, we're going to take x times p of x and then subtract c of x. So if you think about what we're going to do here, my profit is going to be x times, here it is, 2.75 minus a penny per x. So per magazine, huh? And then minus, and by the way, here's a mistake that was made on the test that I don't want you guys to make again. When you subtract a function, c of x, when you go to put the function in, put it in parentheses. So you make sure you, sub do you see why? You, yeah, you're going to have to distribute the negative. You, you want to make sure you subtract the whole function. The whole function is 0.003x squared plus 0.5x plus 5, okay? So my profit function, all right, so we have some distributing to do here, 2.75x minus 0.01x squared minus 0.003x squared minus 0.5x minus 5. So my profit function, let me write it um, in the following way, with the x squareds first, minus 0.013x squared, and then plus 2.25x, and then minus 5. Okay, so there's the profit function. I even know the shape of that function. It's a parabola opening downward. So y you would think there would be a maximum profit, right? All right, what's next? Next step. Take the derivative. P prime of x 
would be negative 0.026x, because I have to multiply, plus 2.25. Set the derivative equal to 0. Negative 0.026x equals negative 2.25. And now if I divide, I'll come up with an x value. So I need to do 2.25 divided by 0 0.026. Let's see, 2.25 divided by 0 0.026, 86 and a half. Okay, so what do you do with that? Well, yeah, we're trying to maximize the profit. And so what it really asks is determine the level of sales that will maximize the profit. It says that X, this is the number of magazines printed and sold in a quarter. Well, are you really going to sell 86 and a half magazines? No. You'd say, well, around 86 or 87 magazines will maximize the profit. Okay? Do you, guys, do you guys follow what I'm saying? And then, let's see, part B. Determine the price the magazine should sell at in order to ma maximize the profit. So that's interesting. I know I need 86 and a half, right? For part B... Let's pull that price function back out. What was the price function? P of x is 2.75 minus 0.01x. So now what I'll do is I'll do P of, say, 86.5. And I'll work out what that is. So you plug it in, and then you use your calculator. So let's see. Let's do... 2.75 minus 0 0.01 times, and then the x value is 86.5. So how much do we want to sell these for? Okay, dollar eighty-eight, dollar eighty-nine, something like that. $2 would probably change it a little bit, okay? But somewhere around $1.89. So, by the way, people know this too. They always put the 9 on the end because that doesn't change the number of buyers. But as soon as you go over that $2 mark, ah, forget it. People are going to say, I'm not going to do it. So it's interesting. It's interesting how that works psychologically. Part C, what is the maximum profit? Do you guys know what to do? Take the X value and put it where? in the profit function. It, it really comes down to just kind of paying attention at this point. What are they asking? Can I answer the question? Now, it's funny because in both of these examples, I haven't really been talking much about endpoints. And I want to do an example before you go that kind of makes it clear what happens. And so, just to be careful about it, let's look at problem eight. because I can work more quickly then. Oh, no, let's do 14. It's even better. 14 is better. So 14, no interpreting anymore. I'm just going to give you a function. f of x is 2x cubed minus 6x squared plus 4. And they tell me this time, hey, we're on a closed interval, negative 1, comma 4. I guess they told me that last time too, guys. What was the closed interval on the last problem? Yeah, because if you look 
at these problems, a lot of times the problems give you some kind of a, a range, a, a domain. 40 to 60 for 27. For the problem we just did, they tell me this price demand function is good as long as you're between 0 and 275. So those could be the endpoints of a problem. Okay? But for a simpler example, I thought we'd do something like 14. Okay. So suppose I say I want to optimize f, f of x, okay? So what I'll do is compute f prime of x. What do I get? I get 6x squared minus 12x. Here we go. So that's my derivative. And then what do I do? We set it equal to 0 because we want to find the critical values. And we're going to factor it, people said. So I'll take out a 6x. x minus 2. So what are the critical values? 0 and 2. Now, when I say optimize the function, that means find its maximum or its minimum. The extreme value theorem tells me they have to occur somewhere in this interval. I told you what the strategy is. Either they occur at the critical values or they occur at the endpoints, right? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a little chart. I'm going to make a little chart where I list the x values that could be places where you have a maximum or minimum. And then I'm going to make kind of an output here. f of x we know is 2x cubed minus 6x squared plus 4. And now what x values should I list? Well, I should list 0 and 2 because those are critical values. But I should also list negative 1 and 4 because those are endpoints. And you guys, sometimes you get a maximum value at a critical value, but sometimes you get it at an endpoint. Right. So if I plug in a 0, you guys see I get 4. If I plug in a 2, well, let's see, 2 times 2 cubed minus 6 times 2 squared plus 4, ouch, 20 minus 24 is negative 4. If I plug in a negative 1, what happens? I get negative 2, I get Minus 6 more is negative 8 plus, oh, I get another negative 4. Check that out. Oh, I got negative 4 for negative 1. I didn't check number 2. Yeah, if you plug in a 2, you also get negative oh. 4. And then how about 4? If you plug in a 4, f of 4 would be, let's see, 2 times, wow, 4 cubed is 64. So that's 128 minus 24 plus 4. That's huge, right? What's that equal? 36. I got, maybe I did it wrong. <laughs> 64 times 2, so I got 128 minus 24 plus, yeah, I'm getting 132 minus 24, I'm getting 108. Did anyone else get that? That's a resounding no. Okay, so what's that? How's it 36? Get out of here. 2 times 4 cubed is 128 minus, oh, minus 64. Now I'm getting 68. All right, I'm having trouble. <laughs> Take my word on it, Paul. No, I refuse. 2x cubed minus 24. And this is worth seeing, by the way. We have the technology. Let's use it. 
plus, oh, minus 20. Oh, that was dumb. Just put in the function I'm trying. Oh, no, you're doing, okay. 6 x squared plus 4. Okay, graph. Ha ha. Well, I sure don't see it. And even if I do zoom standard, I sure don't see it. But if I hit second calculate, I can calculate a value of 4. And what'd you get? That's what you guys told me, wasn't it? 36. OK. So what is the maximum value? Oh, yeah? I'll do that in a second. This would be my maximum value. It's 36. And what would be my minimum value? Negative 4 from either of these. I'm going to let people go. Mike, I am going to do that for you, though. Oh, if you got an error, maybe you use the minus sign instead of the negative sign. Calculate 2. Because it just came up there. I can't even see it, so sorry. Yeah, I'm free until um, until about one. <laughs>